Hi everybody, TJ Mac Vintage Cards, and in today's video, um, before I get started, I want to do a shout out uh, to a new channel that I subscribe to, The Boston Kid, and uh, he's got a, a great uh, vintage collection. He showed off his man cave in a recent video, showed off some beautiful uh, higher grade 1971 Topps baseball cards, as well as some uh, 1970 basketball and just a, a really nice collection and a nice channel. Um, I'm going to put down below a link to his channel if you want to check him out. But I just wanted to recognize him and just appreciate what he's doing in the community with his videos. Now, for today's video, recently I've been talking a lot about just certain seasons that I've enjoyed, be it uh, baseball or football, and even in the future I'm going to do some hockey. Uh, I've talked about 58 football, and I'm doing an ongoing series on that. I've been doing some talking about the 60s with the AFL and also the 61 baseball season. But back in April, I spoke some to the 68 baseball season. I showed off a magazine that I had that talked about the predictions from that year. Now, in college, I did study a lot of U.S. history. I like to read books about uh, U.S. history, especially more modern history. And in the 60s in particular, I find intriguing, um, specifically the 68 season in baseball, but also what was going on in our culture. Uh, it was a very tumultuous year in American history. Of course, you had the assassination of Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King. There were uh, race issues going on in our country, um, changes with civil rights, and then you had a very closely contested election between Richard Nixon and Hubert Humphrey. And while all this was going on, we still had Vietnam, which was um, dividing the country as well. But through all that, there was some promise with uh, the space race. Uh, we started overtaking the uh, Soviet Union, and we saw that peak in 1969 when we landed a man on the moon. So um, even though we had some upheaval going on, there were some things that were uniting Americans during that time. But it was the 68 season in baseball that I'd just become fascinating with, um, specifically the pitching um, from that year. And I talked in the past about how this was known as the year of the pitcher. And I just found it, um, you know, very interesting to me how, like, these changes they made to baseball in the early uh, 60s to increase um, pitching, to, to balance the offense and defense within the game really hit and, and shifted an imbalance more towards the pitching in 1968. You had seven pitchers with an under two ERA, and we had seven pitchers that year with 20 plus wins. And what I'm doing now is I'm putting together um, a collection for display of the rookie cards or first single cards where they're not multiple player rookies of um, various pitchers that I just find a connection with from that year that either you know performed very well or did some things specifically through that season that draws attention to them. And uh, the first ones I'm going to show here are uh, the 59 tops Bob Gibson uh, rookie. And uh, Bob Gibson that year was 22-9 and nine with a 1.12 ERA, 13 shutouts, 28 complete games, and he was third in the league with 268 strikeouts. So just a, an awesome year by him. He won the National League MVP and Cy Young that, that year as well. And then next to him, I've shown this card before, is the 65 tops Denny McLean. That's his rookie card. He was 31-6 and six with a 1.96 ERA, 28 complete games, and he was third in the league with 280 strikeouts. So those guys were really the, uh, the bar for pitchers in 1968. But there's some other great seasons as well that I'm going to talk about. An unsung season from that year was had by Juan Marichal. Um, that's a 61 tops rookie card. He was 26 and 9, so he won four more games than Bob Gibson. He had a 2.43 ERA, which was below the league average, um, but was a little higher when compared to some of the other pitchers from that year. He had five shutouts and 30 complete games, which led the league, and he was eighth in strikeouts with 218. So just a fantastic year had by him. And then the other one I'm going to show here, and this would be his second year card. I do have his rookie, but I wanted a solo card, as I said. This is a 67 Tops Fergie Jenkins, and he was a 20 and 15 that year, so he's one of the 720 game winners. He had a 2.63 ERA, fifth in the league with 260 strikeouts, and he had 20 complete games. So two really nice seasons had by these guys right here. Next picture I'm going to show is uh, the 57 Tops rookie of Don Drysdale. And Drysdale had an interesting year. He was only 14 and 12 in 1968, but he had a 2.15 ERA through 12 complete games, had eight shutouts, which was third in the league, and he pitched six consecutive shutout games in May and June, ending with a 58 and two thirds scoreless inning streak, uh, which was later broken by Oral Hershiser in 1988, who also played with the Dodgers. 
And then the uh, other card here I'm going to show is the 68 Tops Tom Seaver. This is his first single card. Of course, his rookie's in 67. And Seaver was 16 and 12 with a 2.05 ERA, five shutouts, 14 complete games, and was 10th in the uh, league with 205 strikeouts. So, um, of course, um, these pitchers, five of the six of them are Hall of Famers. Denny McLean is not. But I'm also going to show you two um, new additions I've added to this group that I'm going to speak a little bit about to today. So this is here is a, a recent pickup I made, a 65 Tops rookie of Luis Tiant. I uh, just love the colors on this card and that vintage uh, Cleveland Indians uniform. Now, Tiant that year was 21-9 and nine with a 1.60 ERA, which was second in the league. He had nine shutouts, which was also second in the league, and 19 complete games. Um, his 264 strikeouts were fourth in the league, and I believe he finished uh, fifth in the American League MVP voting as well. Now, Tiant pitched his best game that season on July 3rd in Cleveland when he recorded 19 strikeouts in 10 innings against the Twins. And at the top of the 10th, the Twins got runners on first and third with no one out, but Luis Tiant responded by striking out the side. The Indians pushed across a run in the bottom of the 10th to give them a 1-0 victory. Now, Tiant was later thought to be finished at the end of the 71 season at the age of 30 when he finished 1-7 with the Red Sox. But in 72, he had a career resurgence with the Red Sox and he had three more 21 seasons. He also went 3-0 in the American League Division playoff and World Series in 1975. He was 122-81 and with a solid 3.36 ERA with the Red Sox, where he won over 60% of his games. Now, Tiant was thought to be finished again um, after uh, a, a time he was slumping late in the 1978 season. And the Red Sox had started to crawl back into within two games of the Yankees with eight remaining. And prior to the subsequent contest in Toronto, Luis was uh, scheduled to pitch, and he said, if we lose today, it'll be over my dead body. They'll have to leave me face down on the mound. He won, and the Red Sox went on to win their last eight games, including two more victories from Tiant on three days rest. And on the final day of the season, the Red Sox needed a win, and a Yankee lost to force a playoff game. Catfish Hunter and the Yankees lost in Cleveland, and Tiant dazzled the Fenway crowd yet again with a two-hitter against the Blue Jays. Now, as a Yankees fan, we know how that season ended with the Yankees winning, but I give the Red Sox a lot of credit for crawling back into that um, into that division race again and forcing the playoff. Now, in the offseason that year, the Red Sox offered uh, Tion, who was 38 at the time, only a one-year contract. So Luis ended up signing with the Yankees for two years, um, plus a 10-year deal as a scout. And Dwight Evans with the Red Sox said he was devastated at management's ignorance of what Luis meant to that team. And Carl Yastrzemski says he cried when he heard the news. They tore out the heart and soul of this team. And Tiat's uh, September to October record when he was with the Red Sox was 31 and 12. So he was a money pitcher down the stretch. And the Red Sox, of course, would not be in another pennant race for several years thereafter. So, real excited to add this card. I think Tiant's a guy that should get some Hall of Fame consideration. He was certainly an outstanding pitcher. And I appreciate his resilience, um, you know, coming from two points in his career where they thought he was finished and he came back and responded strongly. So, a lot of respect for him. Now, the other card I added here is one that I'm thrilled to have as well, and this is a 64 Tops rookie card of Mickey, Mickey Lalich, who was, um, he was only 17-9 in 1968 with a 3.09 ERA, which was above the league average. Um, he had eight complete games and four shutouts, and those numbers, again, don't really compare too well to the others I've showed today, and he struggled during parts of that season, and he was even sent to the bullpen in August before joining the rotation again. But um, his, his pitching coach at that time was uh, Detroit, in Detroit was uh, Johnny Sane, who I think is one of the best pitching coaches ever. And he worked a lot with Lalich to make him more a complete pitcher. And uh, never gave up on him, and, and Lalich never gave up on himself. And he pitched very well down the stretch, and it was really in the World Series that he became the hero. We know that the ace of that team was Denny McLean, who had the 31 wins, but he struggled more in the World Series. McLean went 1-2, and two, where he lost to Bob Gibson twice in that World Series in uh, games one and four. It was Lalich who really carried the Tigers. Um, he proved to be unbeatable in that series. He pitched three complete game victories, including the exciting finale against Bob Gibson in game seven. Now, the Tigers have been down three games to one in the series, but won games five and six to force a deciding game seven on October 10, 1968. Now, Gibson was on three days rest in that game, and uh, Lalich was only on uh, two days rest, though. 
and they matched uh, goose eggs for the first six innings. Gibson was breezing along, but after getting two outs in the top of the seventh, Norm Cash and Willie Horton singled them, singled in, and uh, Jim Northrup hit a long line drive to center. So he actually scored Cash and Horton. Uh, sorry, I misread that. And then the usually uh, defensive stellar Kurt Flood, uh, he misjudged a ball by initially breaking in, and then he tried to recover, but it was too late. As he's running back to the ball, he slipped on the grass, and the ball sailed over his head. Northrop ended up on third with a two-run triple, and then Bill Freehand, the catcher, knocked in Northrop with a double, and then the Tigers tacked on another run in the ninth with three singles. So they ended up winning that game 4-1 to one and, uh, and the World Series. So um, Lalich was 3-0 um, and o in that series with a 1.67 ERA and 21 strikeouts, and he won the World Series MVP that year. So just, I'm real happy to have um, this grouping of cards together, and I'm going to put a display of this when I finish this into my card room. Here's a display of the uh, eight cards that I have so far for this group um, all put together. And there, there are some others that I want to add, as I said, and I'll show those as they get um, included into my collection. So that's all I have for today. I hope you enjoyed this uh, look back at 1968, the year of the pitcher, and my two new editions of Luis Tiant and Mickey Lalich. And I hope everybody has a great day.